This is a complaint I get quite frequently in my uh, university and college practice where I see athletes on a regular basis. Uh, and I experience it with adult athletes, but they can taper their training a little bit more because these athletes are directed by a coach and we have uh, one training program for all, although all may not tolerate it quite the same way. What I'd like to do is look at some of the common causes of fatigue in the athlete, give us some tools uh, to evaluate, and then hopefully get some directed treatment. Now, fatigue is common. Uh, there's saying that in the United States that the average American is tired by Friday. That's because our week starts on Monday. So I will say the average person in Qatar is fatigued by Thursday. Welcome to my world. But it's uh, by a survey, if we look at all people, it's uh, fairly common. If we look at a prevalence, it's over a two-week period. People, 38% will uh, mention this. And then that ends up being the primary complaint as uh, people seek primary care evaluation. This is a uh, list of common causes of fatigue in athletes. So we will uh, look at this entire list, evaluate it thoroughly, and come up with some game plan. On the contrary, we have to be practical. So there is evidence about the causes of fatigue, but the selection of those topics I will discuss is experience-based. And this is about level four or five, or as uh, Dr. Dexter said, Dexter experience. So my differential diagnosis, and uh, the athletic training room I described here is one where you see a University of Minnesota athletes from all sports. In all sports, athletes come in complaining of being fatigued. So this is, uh, these are the things I see commonly, and this again is from my experience in trying to pass on, saying that we can't possibly evaluate 50 different causes of fatigue and if we're going to say, what's the best bang for the buck, this is what we get. So I look at illness. Have you had a recent illness? Because there are many viral illnesses, and they're kind of uh, cyclic in, in the, the climate in which I live, where we see them at the start of the school year, which is usually September, and highlighted about uh, the uh, December, January time frame at the peak of our winter. Now, people will sometimes have probably an immune modulated problem of post-viral asthenia. The illness comes and goes in seven to 10 days. Uh, that's the normal course. But in a small percentage, there'll be a lingering sense of fatigue that again has been described by the uh, older physicians as that post-viral asthenia. A specific problem, of course, will be infectious mononucleosis, which has a bimodal curve in, uh, in our athletes at the start of the school year and again at the uh, near the beginning of the new year. And obviously, it's identifying, ruling out other causes of fatigue and just saying, reassuring, say we may have to modify training for a period of time, uh, and that is a treatment. Now, if I am suspicious of infectious mono, I'll investigate fairly thoroughly uh, by uh, get, getting proof of the diagnosis so I can give more directed uh, treatment. And even that length of treatment uh, is, is under debate. The second thing I see quite commonly is iron uh, deficiency or uh, iron deficiency without anemia. And this is one where if I just check a hemoglobin, I'll find out it's pretty normal, so I have to investigate further. And it's actually been found to be fairly common amongst women athletes, less so amongst male athletes, most among runners as compared to swimmers or cross-country skiers who also train at similar volumes. Uh, the causes may be nutrition, limiting intake, and some will limit uh, so they do not eat uh, meat. Uh, menstrual losses in women can be a contributor. And there's a thought that foot strike hemolysis may also be an issue. That is probably uh, a minimal uh, uh, contributor. And then losses in myoglobin uh, through exercise and perspiration. Uh, it's been studied and found out that you do lose iron and sweat, but probably a, a minimal amount. But there are multiple causes. Not only is nutrition an issue, but those who are physically active have an increased transit time through the gut, so absorption of iron-containing uh, substances may be inadequate. My evaluation is usually looking at a complete blood count uh, and uh, iron storage through serum ferritin. A much more accurate evaluation is microsomal transferrin, but the cost makes it prohibitively expensive. And, uh, and the risk of using a serum ferritin is that it is an acute phase reactant. So after a really intense hard workout after illness, it falsely goes up and I may not get an appropriate evaluation. 
There is dispute about what a proper level is. If you look at the sedentary population in women, levels as low as 10 are considered physiologically normal. However, for athletes, it kind of arbitrarily said maybe it's 30, some will say as high as 50. Uh, but the research is a little bit uncertain and it's mostly, uh, it, it's not good evidence that we're using, it's mostly anecdotal experience and evidence. And certainly, dietary ways uh, to try to increase iron intake, but they're somewhat difficult, so I end up using uh, oral iron supplements most typically. Another one that's recently uh, popped into my differential diagnosis is vitamin D deficiency. Where I live, we only have about three or four months of the year where sun exposure will result in appropriate conversion of inactive to active vitamin D. And uh, in this climate, uh, People are covered almost all the time, and so I know vitamin D deficiency is a big problem. Now, we used to think vitamin D is a bone vitamin only, but we find out it has many other areas of involvement, immune function, skeletal function, cardiac function, and even normal muscle function. So when I see a fatigued athlete, I am concerned, especially in my uh, climate, concerned about vitamin D deficiency. Uh, normal levels are considered 30 to 80 in the lab that I use, but some have suggested that Normals for an active athlete are different than those who are sedentary, and so my goal usually when I'm treating is uh, vitamin, uh, oral vitamin D replacement and try to get a level above 50. That's somewhat anecdotal and experiential as well because uh, the uh, good evidence is, is lacking and this is practical evidence. Another uh, item that will be dealt with in a little more detail is exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. I've had athletes say all I do is cough but I'm tired all the time when I work out. And so I think this has to be a part of the differential diagnosis for fatigue because it can be a very insidious onset. There may be no prior history when an athlete presents to you. And I'll leave the rest of the discussion to Dr. Dexter. Energy. Energy comes in the form of nutrition. If we don't have enough energy input, we're not going to have enough energy output. And it's amazing how uh, some women who are training at a level of 40 to 50 miles a week somehow can get metabolically efficient enough to exercise on 1,600 to 2,000 calories per day. So we have to consider that they're getting enough fuel in the tank to support their exercise habit regardless of sport. So I do a brief survey to see if they change any dietary patterns. And then if uh, I'm uncertain, I will have them consult with our sports uh, nutritionists to ensure adequate dietary intake. This can occur in men as well as women, and of course uh, another at-risk population in our males is wrestlers who are uh, cutting weight an entire season. One we can't overlook, uh, Dr. Salas has mentioned also depression. If we look at generally the adult population is 12 percent, uh, incidence of prevalence in adolescence is 5 to 8 percent, but we find out that an injured athlete develops situational depression about 27 percent of the time slightly higher in our concussed athletes. They are withdrawn. They've lost their self-esteem in not being able to participate in the sport. And so we have to consider that as, as a possible cause of fatigue because sleep disturbance, fatigue, apathy are common presentations for depression. So don't overlook mental health issues when we get a tired athlete. There is no test for this. There are uh, brief surveys, but mostly I ask about symptoms I associate with depression. And with that, then I'll treat with uh, uh, psychological counseling, other sports psychologists, and or uh, medications. Then the real, the one that's most difficult to define as a sign of fatigue is uh, staleness and overtraining. Now, if we look at uh, progressive resistance exercise, progressive load in terms of training, we have to start uh, low and we build up to improve our performance, whether it be endurance activities, uh, anaerobic activities, there is a training effect. When we get to the overreaching point, that's probably ideal training. But one step beyond that takes us to the phenomena of overtraining. Scientists for years have been trying to find a marker for overtraining, a physiological marker, and as yet we lack one. So it's a diagnosis of uh, exclusion where you have to investigate some of these other common causes. The phenomena of staleness is something that usually is remedied by one or two or three days of relative rest from activity. Overtraining, when diagnosed, however, may take weeks to months of reduction in training to, be, uh, to overcome the symptoms. And there are no specific symptoms other than 
training is not going well, my performances are off, I find no other explanation. This is a difficult one to sell to coaches and athletes because our mo uh, mentality when we're training is more is better. This is one of the theories that it's probably a multi-faceted uh, activity, but it's, it's one that it may have an immune modulated uh, phenomena will ultimately explain, uh, but again, a, a specific diagnostic marker is lacking. Uh, what do we do for this? Well, every athlete has a different threshold. And so training all athletes exactly the same way, especially in endurance sports, may not be as uh, effective. And this is where the coach has to be able to be perceptive and said, I have to individualize certain training programs for the athlete who seems to be overtrained. Now, the other thing I didn't mention is that my first evaluation when I see the athlete is to get a whole category of other symptoms associated to see if I will be directed toward a cardiac issue or some other endocrinologic issue. I also get a good sleep history because uh, their sleep pattern is totally different from any sleep pattern I've ever had where they tend to stay up late and tend to get up early. They tend to take naps. They, and so we also have to have a good sleep hygiene as uh, or avoiding those chemicals of caffeine and such that may interfere with sleep. So that also has to be a part of your history. So with my athletes I see, especially those competing at a high level, it's a common problem with many points in differential diagnosis, but most of them are rare. Those five or six things that are mentioned are the ones most likely. So these are the ones I'd like you to consider when confronted with the athlete who says, Doc, I'm tired. Thank you.